Hello, Widowhood. My guest today is Ms. Kim Anderson, and Kim and I intentionally selected her podcast to air during Mother's Day because we both know that it can be so difficult when your parent is not here. But in honoring our mothers, Kim wanted to share about who her mother is and how she has become the woman she is because of her mom. And I encourage you, as you listen to this podcast, that you remember and be encouraged by the memories that you have from your mom and that you celebrate her with your life and know that we are on this journey with you. Let's get into this conversation now. Many people talk about the ups and downs of married life, but no one really prepares you for life after your spouse passes away. Welcome to Widowhood Real Talk with Tina, a safe place for widows, widowers, and their friends and family to talk about love and loss. Find comfort as you listen to honest conversations between Tina and invited guests who've experienced the loss of their forever partner. Share their stories of love, grief, and healing. You are not alone in this journey. Join today's episode and discover a wealth of resources and learn how to connect with others who are traveling the same path. This is Widowhood Real Talk with Tina. Hello, Widowhood. My guest today is my good friend, Kim Anderson. And I am just so grateful for her to be here for this episode. We are honoring her mother in the episode that you're receiving. This will be right around Mother's Day. So welcome, Kim Anderson, to the widowhood. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. And so this conversation is about Kim being a daughter, Kim mother, and then we may get into some of Kim journey as far as being a mom but being okay. that it's mother's day week that we're planning to do this and that can be super hard when your mother is not here but before we get into that part tell us about your mom oh my gosh she was just i tell you my mom was a trailblazer she was a young teenager when she had me she was 15 years old wow. and, and back then that was just like, are you kidding? How old is this gentleman that you've been seeing that we didn't know about? And my dad was seven years older than her. So it was one of those where they were forced to get married or well, my dad was going to jail. You said and seven years? One, seven years older than my mom. Oh. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So it was literally a shotgun wedding. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like you hear about stuff like that. And so, did you grow up hearing this story? Oh, yes. My uncles told me this story numerous times. And I laugh at that because I'm like, they ended up being the best of friends. Even though as the years went by, I have siblings. I'm the oldest of four. And things ended up not working out for them being married. But they okay. ended up being the best of friends. Okay. So, oh, we, oh, you were saying, I, first I thought you were talking about your uncle being friends with your dad, you're talking about your parents. My parents, yes. Okay, so they were good friends, but not good uh, partners as far as marriage. No, they were not, no. Do you recall how old you were when your parents separated? Yes, I was seven years old. Wow, you remember seven? Girl, I cannot remember seven. Yeah, <laughs> and you know what? I think I remember it's because everyone would tell me that story. Everyone um, would say that. And even though my mom was single, she raises as a single mom, we still saw our dad every weekend. Okay. And that, I'm just, I'm just going to, you know, pull on the black card because there is Go this ahead. concept that all black men are out there are not showing up and doing what they need to do. And that idea, and I'm so glad to be able to share it. Okay. The marriage didn't work, but your dad's responsibility as far as being a and being responsible for this family that he put on this earth was vital to him. Oh, that was definitely important. But for him, for my dad to have us on the weekend, it was always at his mom's house because that's where he lived. So it was really a dual responsibility. It wasn't just on my dad. And I think that helped him become a better 
dad because if he had to do that on his own, I really don't believe my dad could have done it. It was too much of a responsibility for him. Okay. And and back in that day, it literally was women were being trained to be mothers and sons were not where the dynamic is a little different in the year that we're in now where the roles are uh, shared on a different plane than what I think they were before. Oh, so, yes, indeed. So going back to seven, what are some of the memories of your mom? Oh, my gosh. Always just every day was something new. It was a light. She would always, even though she worked, she, she knew she had to work and she wanted to go back to school. Because I was the oldest of the four, I helped out with the kids. I was the second mom to my siblings. So she was, so we could enable her to go back to school. And it was just taking us to the park, putting affirmations on the back of the basement door about everything to do with life. And she was all about looking into African-American history. I always considered our mom, she was a Black Panther, but she was that woman. And she wanted to instill in that in the reading knowledge, to gain knowledge with reading and books. And even though we did not go out to dinner, she always said every month she would take us out to dinner so we would know and learn how to eat out in public. That was one of her pet peeves about that. Okay, you're, you just said a mouthful, so hold on. Okay. You being the second mom to your siblings, and yes. then you mentioned affirmations. Like, where did you find these affirmations in the house? How did that come about? And, and, and do you remember any of those? They would be on index cards taped to the back of the basement door to let us know who you are, where you came from. And her favorite, one of them I always remember was the serenity prayer. That was one that she I always felt that was an affirmation, even though it was a prayer, but it was letting us know to look towards the serenity prayer as we're growing older. So you were leaving to go out the door to go to school, go do whatever it is. And do you see this card? And did you guys read it together as a collective out loud or how did that go? We read it separately, but it was one thing my mom instilled in us to always read it at any time. It could be together, but a lot of us, we didn't have that time to do it together. It was always, we would see it, and sometimes you think, on the back door, you're not going to read it, but you cannot help but look at these index cards on this back door to let you know, to start your journey for the day. Wow. Just the impact of that, To So, it, it sounds, it, it, it gives to me the idea when they say, you know, straighten up your crown. Remember who you are. Life may be difficult and things may be going on, but know what that stands for. Wow. And you then yes. mentioned about reading and history. What did that look like if you could go into that a little bit more? What that looked like to me was my mom would take us to the library and she always said it did not have to always be a black author. She said, I wanted you to learn anything about life or something that you found interesting that you would like. And I always, I'll never forget the first one was Judy Bloom. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. <laughs> that is out of, that was the first thing I can remember with her taking us to the library. And that was the book that I was just like attracted to. Okay. My first book. Uh, wow. So your mom introduced you to reading. And, oh, yes. And you can still remember your first book. How have you maintained a love for reading? How has that gone over the years? Oh, absolutely. I read. There's always something I'm reading every day. Okay. Every day. It is, and, and I have, for myself, I have four children. And out of all the children, my oldest child, she's the only one that reads avidly like me. Okay. <laughs> wow. Any, how about your siblings? Do you know if any of them are avid readers? My brother, he's the only other one, yes. Okay, and so that's 50-50, so I mean, out of four, so that's <laughs> Those are good odds, those are good odds. And so that was your youth growing up. What was your mom's discipline style? She was so easygoing, but it's like, we gave her no problems. Not that we were perfect, but it was like, 
she wanted to be a mom, but she also wanted to be our friend. And I want to be honest, our house was the party house growing up, but you always respected Miss Vicky's home. There was never any trouble. We can party at home. She felt like, I don't want you out there in the streets getting into trouble. That I don't want. So stay at home and be a lady, be a gentleman at home. Don't get out there in the streets and cut up and act the fool. Mm. How did that resonate with your parenting style? You know what? It's so funny because I have adopted that same parenting style. Okay. The same one. And it, and it worked for us. It really did. Our children have not given us any problems with growing up, and now everyone is grown. Okay. And so somebody may hear that and go, oh my gosh, I don't want them partying in the house. But at the same time, you have an idea what's going on in their world. You are now yes. being able to engage with all of their friends. You There's a trust that's been established because they don't have to go out sneaking and doing something. So you've empowered them. Were there right. curfews or was it just all however the children wanted or how did that go for you? It was more so however the children wanted it and that was fine. But there was a time that my mom would be like, okay, 11 o'clock p.m., every, it's time for everyone to go home. And she wanted us in the house. And okay. that was okay. At well, that time, you probably tired. I'm like, okay, y'all got to go. <laughs> yes, it is time to go home. <laughs> okay, so do you, like, I mean, was your mom out there dancing with you guys in the party or she just was in the house nearby? She would do both. When she got tired, she would go on upstairs. And then as we got older, like 16, 17, she would get to the point where she'd be like, I can go out for one night on my own, go out for a few hours and let you young people have the house. So she did respect us enough and trust us enough where she felt like she didn't have to be in the home at the same time. So at 16, your mom allowed you to have company and she was out of the house. Yes. Okay, yeah, I did not see any of that in my lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I didn't get oh. none of that. I didn't get none of that, no, ma'am. Oh my that god, sounds like a dream. <laughs> it was, it was, it was nice. It was definitely nice. Okay, wow. So those were your teenage years. What did it look like as you became an adult in the relationship with your mom? How did that change? Oh my gosh. We, you know, something, I got married young. I was 21. So it was like, by the time I had a high school, working during high school and then, then getting married, our relationship still was just as tight, like that family unit that you had. But she always respected me that when we're having children, that was another thing. She would always be right there if you needed her. She was wow. not like always coming over to your house. You know, she wanted to give you that growth so you can grow into becoming a wife, grow into becoming a mother. And I didn't, with my mom, you didn't see that because of her, my dad and her being separated. You didn't see that, um, I guess the word is um, that unit that okay. you did not see growing up. But that's interesting because even though the unit did not work for her, she respected the unit and knew the yes. importance of it. And and that is that is very valuable. Because sometimes people think because someone's not doing a thing, they don't have a value for the thing. And your True. mother showed you that, okay, that didn't work with your dad, but she definitely saw the importance. And to empower you to, that must have been like, kind of like you wanted to talk to her and you're like, okay, I got to do it myself. <laughs> now, did your yes, mother live in it, close it, proximity it, to you? Yes. We were only 15 minutes away. Oh, okay. Okay. And what area were you living in then? At that time, Montclair, New Jersey, and my mom was in East Orange, New Jersey. Okay. Okay. So born and raised in New Jersey? Yes. Born and raised Morristown. Okay. So what, what are you, okay. So now you're having children and still living in New Jersey and your mom is 15 minutes away. Do you remember any motherly advice or guidance that your mom provided or just her presence or how that worked for you? More, she was just always, I think for my mom, she was always hoping that she would say, not that, I guess more so like, don't have a person like your dad. My dad was a gambler. 
that was one of his vices. And he gambled too much. He just wanted to make sure that we never got with a man that was a gambler. Because it okay. took away from your household. Okay. And so were you able to accomplish that? Yes, indeed. Okay. And that is important yes, because indeed. sometimes we subconsciously repeat patterns that did not serve people in our family well. And it is right. an effort to truly say, don't do that and intentionally choose something different because it identified that that did not work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's so funny because my dad was a worker. He would work. He had no problem keeping a job and working. He worked at Jersey Central Power and Light Company until he retired. But he just had that vice of being a gambler. Mm. And sometimes, I'm glad you used the word vice because sometimes things will just grip us. They will hold on to us and the fight to disassociate ourselves with it can often be harder than we really think it will be. Oh, absolutely. So did that make you afraid of just, and, and I can relate to that. My dad um, had no problem keeping a job, but him and the lottery tickets. Oh, oh. My <laughs> gosh. I don't know of him going out gambling, but we would, at the end of the year, tally up the amount that was spent on lottery tickets and then oh sit there God. amongst my sisters. Somebody, this could have been my dress. This could have been my outfit. <laughs> this could have been this. <laughs> but it is that allure of I could get more instead of thinking of yes. these little pieces we could put away that would actually add up to the more we were searching for. Absolutely right, Tina. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'm not even like, I'm out there like, I, I dream like winning the lotto, but I don't play it. So I don't know what, what I'm really dreaming about because so it just turned me off from seeing that. <laughs> like every now and then I'll think about it, but I just have that memory of yes. it's like, I am not here for it. So I can understand <laughs> intentionally wanting to pick something different after seeing that. And, and on a different note, let me, but what my mom and dad, even though they separated all those years, they never got divorced because back then they could not afford a divorce. It was not feasible. So when my mom passed, she passed before my dad. He, he was a widow. He was a widow. <laughs> wow. Okay. I, so they were separated and living like that for how long? 35 plus years. Okay. 35 plus years. Okay. Did you, were you conscious that they were still married or did you even think of that or just realize it later as an adult? Oh no, we still knew. We okay. always knew. My mom let us know. And they always, even though they were not married, they were just, they, they were comical to me because they were friends and I never understood. How do you still do taxes together and you're not, you know, you're not married? <laughs> But How you doing, Mary Fine joining me? How'd that work? How'd that work? <laughs> yeah, but no. But you know what? Technically, now that I think about it, they were married. They're still married. They just were not living in the same household. And you know, I have seen some instances where that level of closeness just doesn't work for everybody. There are some people that live in the same house and they have different bedrooms. Um, I guess you got to find out what your jam is in that situation to make it work for you. Oh my gosh, indeed, because they both had significant others throughout their lives. So whenever there were family events, everyone would be, hi, how are you? It was the friendliest thing. Very friendly. <laughs> okay, so your your parents, they're, they're, they're original swingers out there. Like they... <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. Okay, okay, okay. If the grandkids don't know, they're going to know now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, indeed. They'll they'll be just fine. They'll be fine. But it's funny. They were just, I, I always, I look back on that. And I'm like, that was comical that they can be friendly to, I guess it was a level of respect to that significant other. I know this is who you're with, Vicky, and you're with Dexter, and that's okay. Okay. And, and I guess if you have that understanding and that agreement, I have some friends and widows that are polyamorous where they have open relationships. So if they're able to think that that communication eliminates drama, but it's when people are untruthful 
and dishonest in relationships where I think it tends to cause more of a problem because you've misrepresented yourself where you have oh, told absolutely. me it will be this way and then you find out it's not, then you feel like the relationship is built on a lie. So so what is there, what else do we have if you couldn't be honest about that piece? So I oh, can see absolutely. that being a problem. So at least just if it just be upfront with what it's gonna be. But that's what they were because they always told someone, I I'm no longer with my wife or my husband, but we are still legally married. So I will never marry again. That I always thought that was their um that was their crutch between the two of them. They don't okay. have to take that final step, but they also no longer ever have to marry anyone else again. So do you think so a lot of people feel like marriage is just a sheet of paper. What does marriage mean to you? It is the total commitment, loyalty, and honesty to me. And that just enrichment. And as I've been married for 35, well, oh my gosh, my goodness, it's 38 years. <laughs> wow. Wow. 30, 38 years. It makes me realize it's not about just a piece of paper. It's really not. It's you value what you put into it. You put your whole life, half of your life is into this marriage mm -hmm. and into this man. Right. Or oh, that man into that woman. And yes. I think marriage is pro being married and having children are two of the most selfless acts that we can endure because if someone's going into a marriage with the idea of what this other person is going to do for them, I think they're going to be sadly mistaken <laughs> the work <laughs> and it is rewarding is fulfilling, but the work that you have to do to make a marriage successful. And if both parties are equally working that hard and it sounds right. like you and your husband are, then you're able to have something beautiful. Yes, indeed. We are fortunate. Thank you. I, I, I can attest to that. I can attest to that. <laughs> so how did you get from New Jersey to where you currently live? That's interesting because we had, we were looking to buy a house and we knew in New Jersey it was going to be too high. And we kept seeing signs about the Poconos, you know, hearing things on the radio about finding a home in the Poconos. So we're like, let's look up there. And we both had good jobs and we ended up moving to Tobyhanna, Pennsylvania. <laughs> and in I want to say 1999. And that and that that was a big push for a lot of people that left New York and relocated to Toby Hanna. And there was the allure, if I recall correctly, of the Marx bus system that you could relocate to Pennsylvania and take a bus back to New York and to be able to live. I mean, to be able to work. Yeah. So now you have the New York money, but you have the Pennsylvania lifestyle, which is totally different. Right. <laughs> so how did you, like, what did you think of the woods, the Toby Hanna, Pennsylvania compared to New York? Was that, what, what did you think of that? Oh my gosh, you're talking about an adjustment coming, you know, for us coming from Jersey, we were Jersey people. So I always figured we're transplants and our oldest child was sixth grade and then we had fourth grade, then we had kindergarten. So it was a whole new world to them. They were used to that city life and coming here to Toby Hanna when, when everything got dark, it was dark. <laughs> we were like, no street lights. We were like, what's going on? We were in a development and we were like, do you hear the crickets? You hear everything. Oh <laughs> my gosh. Deer. Oh my gosh. That was another thing. We're like deer and they coming out of, out of the woodwork. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> that is. And so I am from Chicago, born and raised. And I remember um, being in an area similar to like Toby Hanna. And I'm like, well, where are the street lights? Like, how does this work? <laughs> Yeah. Like, yeah. how do you drive? <laughs> and when I started driving, um, I got a car and Mark was like, will you turn on your high beams? And I was like, what are those? Because I had <laughs> never been in an area that I needed high beams. If I was on a highway, right. wherever I was, there were lights. And to do and and let us not forget the windy roads that are in. Yes. 
Toby Ooh. Hannah. And indeed. And then you add on a little bit of snow and ice to all of that. Oh my gosh. Do so you have a that's an old relic and you're like, here we go again, where it can still snow in April. <laughs> exactly. So when your family came to visit, what did they think of that area compared to where you were in New Jersey? They were like, I don't know how you do it. First of all, it's too long of a drive. <laughs> that they did not like. Then they're like, you're out here. They felt like you were out in the wilderness, whereas we would call it the boondock. Okay. <laughs> And I was just like, you get up here and so you can get away from the city. It's similar to almost like if you were in the country, okay. just taking the country air, relax. We didn't get too many visitors, but let me tell you, for that first year us living in Tobahanna, we were going down to Jersey every weekend. <laughs> wow. So living in New Jersey, did your mom remain in New Jersey when you moved to Pennsylvania? She did. For a little while after, you know, maybe about 10, maybe about five or so years, she ended up moving down to Martinsburg, West Virginia with my sister. That's a year under me. Really? She wanted okay. to move. She wanted to move down there. She was like, she had had, a, my mom had a lot of illnesses later okay. on in life, you know, early 50s. She had, you know, started to gain illnesses, but really? she wanted to move down with my sister and her boys because my youngest nephew had cerebral palsy. So okay. she wanted to go down there and help her with her family. So she stayed down there for a good three years, but she hated it because she's, my mom was a city girl. Okay. Very much city. My mom, here she was, born and raised in Morristown, New Jersey, moved to East Orange. And she said, I cannot stand this country down here. It's too much of country living. So she ended up moving back to East Orange. Wow. Even though we were still in Pennsylvania, she ended okay, up so moving back. Was there a family conversation as far as your mom moving with your sister or that was just a decision between them and you just got the phone call and it was happening? It was just a decision between them. And she was just like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down there and help them out. And I said, okay, mom. All right. And we would go, we would take turns to go down there or they come up this way for Thanksgiving, we still kept that connection going, even though they were down there in Virginia. Right. Okay. So now your mom moved back to East Orange. But if we don't, if we can circle back, you mentioned about different illnesses that your mom um, was dealing with. Do you recall what they were? And you can explain about those a little bit. Yes, my mom had IBS, irritable bowel syndrome was one problem. COPD was her major one. And she also had a protein S deficiency, which that was that has to do with um, blood clotting. So she had blood clotting disorder. That's another one. Okay, how did that through. how did that start impacting her mobility? Very limited. My mom ended up within the last two years of her life having to be on oxygen twenty four seven, and she also suffered from sleep apnea, so she had to wear the mask at night. Wow, that must, with the oxygen and trying to wear, but I guess the, with the sleep, um, the CPAP, then it's blowing air in, so you're kind of getting, so that's, yes. Happened. Did you say your mom was a smoker, or how did she get CPOD? She, yes, she was a smoker. Okay. You know, growing up, she was a smoker, and then she ended up, she had, once she found out she had the COPD, she had stopped. But of course, by then, you've already done the damage right. to your lungs, to your body, and everything. Mm -hmm. And she was always active. My mom was always walking. Walking was the best thing that she could do. And so okay. when she was, when she got to the point where she was too sick, that that took away from her. And it just started her. She would get into a depression, you know, okay. at times. But she would always say, one of her sayings, eat, drink, and be merry, no matter what. So come the holidays, it was just like, all right, we know what we were having. You wanted to have, a, if you were sick, we had blackberry brandy to put in your tea. That was one of the things. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And from what I recall, you spent a great deal of time traveling back and forth, caring for your mom and being there working. And can yes. you share and I, I remember that difficulty. For you and that level of commitment 
to your mom. Um, and so now looking back on that, what do you remember about that, that period of your life? You know, that was the period when I was first doing a volunteer deployment as a civilian. And I did three tours overseas. And my mom would tell me, she was already back here in East Garden. She said, you keep going back and forth overseas. Is, is this something that's enabling you with your life to take care of your finances? Yes, it is, mom. Okay. Have you reached your goal, what you need to do for your family? Yes, I have. And she would say, she said, so now it's time for you to stop going overseas. And I'm like, huh, I didn't think about that because it was my first opportunity. I knew I had Kevin, my husband here, and he would take care of the family with no problem. And it was, it was a transition, but it was much needed. It helped me, it helped me grow too as a person. Okay. And to know I didn't have to just be a mom and a wife. I can go out there and help serve others out there. And I, you know, it was um, an enriching experience for me. And my mom told me that my last tour, she said, stay home and just take care of the family now. And I did that in 2012. May of 2012, I came back. That was my last tour. And I had did 10 months. And that's when she started to get a lot sicker. So okay. then I would go over to her place every weekend and help her as far as cooking, doing her laundry for her, and just spending the quality time with her and not even realizing because she would be back and forth to the hospital. And we would be like, she would make a joke. I'm only going there for <laughs> That was her joke. Like, okay, mom. Okay. We just know you're coming home. But then she just started getting sicker and sicker. You okay. know, for so the last time when she went, it was just like it wasn't a tune up. <laughs> and when you say every weekend, just for concept, driving one way, about how long did that take? Two hours. So we're talking four hours driving, and you're not going yes. on vacation, you're going there to work. And yes. were you, <laughs> I mean, the level of care that you were given for your mom, were you having to bathe her, care for her to that level? Or what did you have to do no, for her? That was, just the cooking and helping her clean. As far as my mom was very independent. She okay. would be, she was still able to bathe, bathe herself. Whatever she could do, she was just like, that's one thing she did not want us to do for her. Okay. If that could be helped. And she got her wish. We did not have to bathe her. <laughs> Good. I want to give space for you to share this, how it works best for you. What do you okay. remember about your mom transitioning from this world and what led up to that? Oh my gosh. She, it was the week, it was the week during um the week of Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving has always been one of our mom's favorite holidays. She did not care for Christmas because Christmas was all about everyone spending so much money and giving these gifts that were not needed or were just put to the side. And she didn't care for that. She said the symbolism for Christmas had changed mm. for her. So Thanksgiving became her holiday. And it's funny because Kevin and our anniversary is always is November 22nd. So sometimes it can fall on Thanksgiving or not. It all depends on that time of year. And she would always call, always call us on a Thanksgiving. And we didn't, I mean, on our anniversary, and we didn't hear from her. But then she got with us, I'm thinking it was, she didn't call on that day. But the day before that, she kept saying something was wrong. And she was in the hospital. And they were just kept running tests. They knew the problem. And she said her belly kept hurting so bad. And we were just like, really? Like, call the doctor, we'll see. See, and a few hours later, in the middle of the night, the doctor calls and says, your mom has um, taken a turn for the worst. We want all the family members to come down. And mind you, at this time, here, my brother, he was in New York. Okay. My brother and his husband, they were, in New, they were in New York and had to come down. And we get there and she's our, she had a DNR. She knew she did not want any type of um, resuscitation at all. Okay. And I was I was literally in denial when I came into that room and we saw our mother. It was just like, no, she said she's just coming for a tune-up. There's, you know, there's right. nothing wrong with mommy, you know, nothing like mm -hmm. that. But 
to be there and the whole family come there. It was just a, it was just amazing. It was, and then one of her sisters, she is a reverend and she was there and we just prayed over my mom as we saw she was passing that transition because there was nothing any longer that she could say this at that point. Okay. She was already, they had her on the machine and she was just like, you know, no, no DNR. And then we're just like, okay, what's next? What's next? And I'm asking the nurses and they're telling me, but here my children are saying, ma, they're telling you, Grammy, that's her name, Grammy. That's what okay. that's the children called her, that she's not going to wake up and come out of this. So we actually were there when she passed. And it was the hardest thing that we could ever have done. But I was so glad that we were all there. You know, it was the most, and people know it's just the most heartwarming. It's the hardest time of your life, but it's also heartwarming that you were there during that transition. You were able to say goodbye and just love on them and kiss on them and everything. So we were glad that we were um, there and I was able to be there and do that. But she ended up dying from a pulmonary embolism in the belly. It's, you know, because then it just will travel. That's what okay. happened. And how did you navigate? What did that look like for you mentally after your mom passed? You talked about the denial up front, being in the room of your children, having to adjust to the reality. What do you recall about those first days, weeks, and months after your mom died? How life looked for you? I couldn't. I just, I couldn't even recall anything because I just remember after that, just sitting down and in the hospital and couldn't move for a long time, just sitting down and recognizing, you know, of course, then you go through the services, the viewing and everything like that. But uh, we knew our mom always said she wanted to be cremated, always. And I, to this day, I have a teardrop that I wear and my mom's cremains. She's with me every day. Mm. That was something that I wanted and one of my sisters wanted. But the two other siblings, they didn't want that. That was, and I said, that's your choice. That's okay. Not everyone wants part of the cremains, not at and all. But as a, you know, but as a mom and dealing and how close my kids were with my mother and just trying to help them navigate, I think I really concentrated more on them than myself. I love how you said, thank you for sharing that. Um, and Sometimes it's an easy story to tell. Sometimes it's a hard story to tell. And you mentioned about giving your siblings space to grieve the way they needed to grieve. Was that something you were taught growing up or how did you come to the concept? Because oftentimes when people are grieving the same person, when someone else's grief looks different than theirs, they try to push them into doing what they're doing. How did that not become a thing for you? I had to just think about it because I said, well, we're all different. Yes, we're, this is our mom, all the same mom. And I said, but they grieve our mother differently than me. And I think for that instance, we no longer lived under the same roof. They lived in different states. So that's what made it different. But to this day, those made us closer, you know, to keep that unity going, even though mommy is not here. That respect, that respect of giving someone space to manage their loss, the way it works for them. Yes. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Yes, indeed. How do for you the see? longest time, I tell you. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I said for the longest time for Mother's Day it used to be the hardest thing to go into the store to get a looking at cards and you've seen everyone look to celebrate their mom. So for the first two years, that was, that was crushing. That was a crushing blow. You yes. know, but you know, you get past that. You do. How did you, and so was it just the elapsing of time you got through it or how were you managing your grief? It was just the lapse in time, lapse okay. in time. And I just remember being thankful that we did have my mom for as long as we did. My mom was only 63 years old when she passed. Okay. So and you I started felt having like gratitude. That was too young. You yes. Like, you, yes. You allow gratitude to be stronger than the sadness. Absolutely, because I get all my strength and wisdom from my mama. All okay. of it. 
And so how do you see yourself being a mother now in what your mom instilled in you? Where do you reflect your mother? All her goals as being, um, doing the right thing to be there for your kids, but not being all up in their business, so to speak. You wanted to know that they can come to you for anything, but you don't have to know all their business. And it's like, all my children are different. You have one that'll just tell you everything. Then you have the others that tell you, hey, then you got one that just don't say anything. If there's anything I need to tell you that's worthy, I will tell you. Otherwise, everything is status quo. <laughs> and that's <laughs> my older style. Because that she reminds me of myself. <laughs> okay. So that's how you were growing up. For, that's how I was. For people, so you talked about how difficult it was in those early years after your mom passing. If someone is listening to this podcast and it's Mother's Day weekend and they are struggling, their mom just passed within the last 11 months, what would you share with them? I would say go back and look at your last year with your mom that you've had, those moments, and think about those to help you get through this upcoming Mother's Day. And just lean on that and know who your mom was and recognize, yes, we know it's life and there is death, but know that you did the right thing, that you were with your mom. It may not have been during her death, but you've always been there in support of your mom and with your mom. Those memories to to honor her life and to continue thinking of the beauty of their life. It is interesting because the moment of death can be so large that it seems to swallow up all of the memories in the beginning. Like you cannot even find them. Did you struggle with that at all? No, I did not. I felt like I had the multitude of memories and music was one of them because my mom, it was like Saturdays was cleaning, cleaning day. I mean, that thorough cleaning where you dusting, you polishing, you doing everything. And I love the music we grew up on, you know, back in the 60s and the 70s. And I'm like, Teddy Pendergrass is one of her favorites. We listen to the OJs, okay. <laughs> the Whispers, all that good music. And we were just like, okay. And that's what, even to this day, my kids, when they clean, they listen to music. It's a soothing thing. And it's just enough to keep you moving. You're like so excited for the day. You know, you have to clean, you, but just still just like, it's, it's exciting. <laughs> Okay. And and do they know that that playing the music cleaning comes from Grammy? Yes, they do. Okay. (laughs) And I know I'm doing the right thing because my kids, especially my younger daughters, I am a grandmother and she has four children. She always tells me, mom, I learned from the best on how to be a mother. And I said, oh my gosh, Kiera, I said, I learned from my mom. So yes, you did learn from the best. That's just something that's been instilled in me that has traveled down to my child. And I said, I love that watching her become a mom. It's bittersweet because it's like, you know, you no longer have any babies. Everyone's grown. I know when the pictures come, you're sending them to me like, we had another one. And they're so (laughs) cute and and, and being there. And so being a mother, what advice would you give to someone that is newly a mother and, and on this uncharted path? Be kind to yourself as a mom and give yourself grace because you are not perfect and you will not be a perfect mother. And I always say you can be the imperfectly perfect person. (laughs) Oh, okay. I'm perfectly perfect person. That, I like that. I like that. When you thought about having this conversation, were there some things in particular that you wanted to discuss that I may have not, we may have not broached upon? I really wasn't sure what I wanted to discuss or even talk about, but it's, you've covered a lot of everything. I thought, and I'm thinking you did very well in bringing up topics and things that can enrich the conversation. And just, I thought you dug, you dug a little deeper. You went back to, you know, starting from the beginning then. How are you with your, you know, myself being married and having children, plus being a grandmother? No, there's nothing else. Nothing. Okay. Well, I will allow you to close out this conversation. Um, 
and say what you would to the people that are listening, knowing that it's Mother Day weekend. Some people may be mothers themselves. Some people may be missing their mothers that are no longer here or maybe be in the duality of that, like you are in both of those places. So however you would like to close out this conversation. What I would love to say to all the mothers out there or mothers to be, just hang on to your multitude of memories if your mom is deceased because that's what keeps me going. And I love, I love Mother's Day now. At one point I didn't, I didn't used to love it, but now I'm back to loving it and just remembering my mom. If, you, if you're lucky to have your mom with you, be with her. If it's not on Mother's Day, you be with her. One of those that weekend, treat it that weekend. Everything's busy on Mother's Day. So be with her, whatever you do. <laughs> Kim, thank you so much for making space for this conversation and honoring your mom and your own motherhood and your daughter and all the people that are listening. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for spending another episode with Widowhood Real Talk. If you found the contents of today helpful, share the episode to anyone you know who may need it. Subscribe to the show and tune into Widowhood Real Talk each week. Then visit widowhood-realtalkwithtina.org to join the community and access additional resources. Remember, you are not alone in this journey.